Hi, it's Katrina, the San Ching Dui Jade. In the spring of 1929, a farmer in the quiet village of San Ching Dui in China's Sichuan province was digging a well when he discovered a large stash of amazing jade artifacts. They were unlike anything anyone had ever seen before, and Chinese archaeologists scoured the area for years looking for more evidence of the lost people who had made the artifacts. It wasn't until 1986 when two massive sacrificial pits were discovered, each one containing thousands of gold, bronze, jade, ivory, and pottery artifacts that were unlike anything that had ever been found in China. These were the remains of an ancient culture dating back 3,000 to 5,000 years, a culture nobody had even suspected existed. The artifacts in the sacrificial pits had been broken and burned prior to being carefully buried as offerings to ancient gods. The objects included the largest bronze masks ever discovered, the largest and best preserved bronze statue of an upright human figure, a 12-foot-tall bronze tree, axes, tablets, sculptures with animal faces, dragons, snakes, birds, human-like heads with gold foil masks, and knives, rings, a giant wand, and a complete sacrificial altar. This discovery effectively rewrites the history of early China. Prior to this discovery, the accepted history was that Chinese culture began in the north and spread out from there. This discovery proves that there was a thriving and distinct culture in the south, never described in any historical texts, and otherwise completely unknown. Archaeologists have linked the San Qing Dui culture with the ancient Shu dynasty, but exactly who they were and what happened to them remains a mystery. Ancient Solar Disk It might be hard to imagine any ancient power rivaling the Roman Empire, but one such group from Romania had built an impressive group of fortresses in the 1st century BC and apparently gave Rome a run for its money. At least for a little bit. The Dacians were mostly Thracians who once inhabited the area of the Carpathian Mountains and west of the Black Sea. They later expanded to include Scythians and Celts who formed an alliance against the Romans. In the first century, King Burebista united the tribes and established the capital in the Oresti Mountains in western Romania. Little remains today of their empire and they are still shrouded in mystery. Of the structures that still stand, there are a group of heritage sites with an impressive display of massive stone rings or discs, as well as a structure of standing stones known as Romania Stonehenge. The Andesite Sun is a large stone disc believed to be a sundial. It was crafted from 11 blocks measuring in total about 22 feet, with 10 rays carved into the surface of each slab. The disc also has a long arrow made from 16 stone blocks, evidence that it was used for astronomical purposes. The Dacians were influenced by contact with Hellenistic Greece, and geometry and astronomy were important elements to their society. The sacred zone of Sarmi Zegetusa includes temples, sanctuaries, and other constructions dedicated to spirituality and astronomy. The sanctuaries there are said to correspond to the movement of the Sun, the planets, namely Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, with one corresponding to the Moon. The circular collection of pillars are said to be dedicated to specifically worshipping the Sun, functioning as a sacred circle used for rituals and magical practices. But the Andesite Sun is an equally important part of the complex, used as an altar together with the temples at the site to aid the ancient Dacians in their religious ceremonies and rituals. Although it suffered massive destruction after the Roman conquest in 106 AD, it stands as a testament to the ancient people of Romania and their astronomical beliefs. Gotland Stones In Gotland, Sweden, 3,600 prehistoric grooves were found scored into the surface of stones scattered throughout the island. Some were found directly imprinted into limestone bedrock, and others were found on some 800 other stones. With some structures that date back to the Neolithic times, Gotland has stone rows or circles and dolmens, and large megalithic tombs dating back to 3,600 BC. Some seem to correspond to astronomical alignments, including connections to the Moon, to major Sun events, as well as connections to other planets, stars, and constellations. Most of the grooves measure from 1.5 to 3 feet long, 2 to 4 inches wide, and 4 inches deep. None of the grooves are parallel, with most crisscrossing over one another. Some believe the grooves are the result of rainwater, but it looks more like they were cut into the rock by some ancient people. Found on the largest island in the Baltic Sea, they are the largest concentration of grooved stones in Europe. Evidence of similar stones have been found in France dating from the Neolithic era. When they were first discovered, researchers wondered if they were made to sharpen Neolithic axes or stones during the Middle Ages. 
but with no weapons found in excavations at the site, that theory is still up in the air. When researchers at NASA studied the grooves, they were able to compare them to the start and end of the full moon on different dates in a 19-year interval. But until more analysis is done, the reason for these stones and their mysterious grooves will remain as mysterious as the prehistoric people who created them. Roswell Rock Even though it happened over 70 years ago, the Roswell incident continues to inspire fascination and speculation. As a refresher, in 1947, the U.S. Air Force claimed to lose a balloon that crashed at a ranch near Roswell, New Mexico. Since then, many ufologists believe that an alien spacecraft, or several, had crash-landed in Roswell and that it was covered up by the military. More or less, that's how it goes. More recently, a man named Robert Ridge set out to do a little deer hunting in 2004, near the site of the infamous crash. What he found set the rumor mill spinning once again. After coming across a strange object protruding from the ground, it looked like a rock, so Ridge picked it up and cleaned its surface, revealing a strange pattern. In the image, there are two crescent moons joined at the corners that look similar to a set of crop circles that appeared in England in 1996. The engraving was crafted with incredible precision. So was the rock left behind by an alien visitor or a souvenir made for tourists? To find out the origin of the strange object discovered in the New Mexico desert, Ridge contacted two ufologists who spent time trying to find out whether the item was real or if it was simply a souvenir from a stand at Roswell. After studying the two-inch wide artifact under a microscope, they were unable to find any tool marks and they later determined the rock actually had magnetic properties. Perhaps it was made from a lodestone, the original natural magnet used in early compasses. They also determined it was not native to the area where it was found, where limestone is the more common rock. With clear defined beveling, researchers believe it had to have been cut with a laser, since sand blasting alone would not be able to obtain the same results. Some people believe the engraving could possibly depict the existence of parallel universes. After a group from a show called Ancient Aliens, perhaps you've heard of it, conducted a CT scan on the stone, they proved that it was not hiding a magnet inside. Although others continue to try to prove that the stone is fake and easy to replicate, whether the rock is a cosmic map or a promotional item is still up for debate. Romanian Giants a group of mystical cave churches in Romania with ties to early Christianity are the site of previously unknown archaeological and cultural treasures. Used as a place of worship for thousands of years, the area has hundreds of legends and reports of paranormal occurrences. High in the Buzau Mountains, there are over 15 cave settlements that have been uncovered over three square kilometers. But the strangest thing is that they seem to have been built by giants. The region is known as Athos or Giant's Land. Some of the caves are geological forms, while others have been carved into it over the years. Another area, Rosia Montana near Transylvania, is a well-known mining area, where in 1976, a strange skeleton was unearthed reported to measure 32 feet tall. Its legs were on one side with the head on the other. Since it was so large, it was sent to Moscow, and since then nothing else has been reported about the giant. But the story of this strange find started long before the discovery. 5,500 years ago, ancient Scythians who occupied the area built an underground gallery, which was later unearthed in February 2012, when a group of geologists were following a gold vein in the same area. This place was valued by humans for thousands of years. Upon uncovering the gallery, they also discovered a gravestone which was later found to be made from 50 karat gold dust, granite dust, and wolfram, a chemical element. Even stranger, the rock was made with a type of technology not known in modern times. Known as the Hyperborean Gallery, the area was later sealed after the discovery of the giant skeleton. On the gravestone accompanying the remains, there was a strong bas-relief writing in a diagonal spiral pattern covering it. Upon removing the stone, researchers found the entrance to a pit with a spiral staircase and violet light radiating from inside. After a number of other strange occurrences, including the disappearance of a paleolinguist who entered the pit to find the origin of the strange light, nobody was brave enough to go in with him, and he never came out. The army later sealed it, and it was never spoken of again. With a number of legends in Romanian folklore surrounding giants, it's difficult not to speculate that those stories could have in fact been true. And with additional unusually tall skeletons uncovered in other mountainous regions of Romania in the 40s and 80s, the discovery of huge humanoid skeletons is quite mysterious.
But considering the fact that most of these discoveries seem to go missing soon after being unearthed, if they ever really happen at all, leaves the truth in the dark. Naupa Waka, Peru. High up in the remote mountains lies a megalithic marvel. The sacred site of Naupa Huaca in Peru demonstrates incredible craftsmanship and engineering inside a mountain cave. There is an inverted V-shaped entrance carved into the mountainside with a false door that goes to nowhere, but it is large enough for someone to sit inside it comfortably. Known as a spirit door, this false door marks the passage of the Earth's electromagnetic currents known to generate out-of-body states. This was a spiritual place used for shamanic rituals. The question is, how did they get the shape so precise and the walls so smooth? What tools did they use? Upon first glance, its three doors are strikingly similar to three-door temples built by the Incas and Egyptians. Its builder was able to find part of the mountainside that had traces of blue stone. The blue stone contains a type of crystal that has magnetic properties. This stone has been used in other spiritual Neolithic sites around the world, most notably Stonehenge, whose builders went 200 kilometers to find it. Besides the perfect lines and smooth surfaces, the main area is also cut to a perfect fifth in musical notation, one that would definitely help in channeling music or incantations during rituals. Like other temples that are similar around the world, Naupawaka is found in a remote location with a sensory-deprived environment that can generate the perfect conditions to experience other levels of reality. While the spiritual origin of this three-window portal seems to point to something from another world, some culture long before the Inca appeared has left a lasting impression. Asun Obelisks the city of Aksum, Ethiopia was once the epicenter of the powerful Aksumite kingdom from 100 BC to the 12th century. The obelisk of Aksum is an enormous steel or obelisk that weighs 160 tons, ornamented with two false doors at the base and carved decorations on all sides that look like windows. Dating back to the 4th century, it is one of many stelae carved and erected in the kingdom. It was a very old practice, most likely inherited from the Kushites. Over time, many of these obelisks collapsed, but when the Italians occupied Ethiopia in 1935, they stole it and moved it to Rome. It was cut into five pieces and then reassembled as a monument in the city. After much contention and many years of diplomacy, the 1700-year-old granite obelisk was finally returned to Ethiopia. The 24-meter-high stone is an important national symbol and considered a sacred object. Like many other ancient objects, people are astounded at how this hard granite could have been carved so long ago with such precision. Doing something on this scale is tough even today, so what kind of tools did they use, and how did they get it up in the air? Their false doors and sharp lines remind some people of modern apartment buildings. Some researchers think that some of these stelae are much older than we think. Perhaps they were inherited by the Kingdom of Aksum and were re-erected by the people afterwards. Regardless, these enormous monuments have witnessed many things that have probably been lost to history. Cambodia's Medieval Cities In 2016, archaeologists revealed the discovery of previously undocumented cities hidden in the Cambodian jungle. Not far from the ancient temple city of Angkor Wat, LiDAR technology revealed multiple cities hiding in the jungle dating back to medieval times. As one of the most popular tourist attractions in Cambodia, Angkor Wat is considered one of the most important archaeological sites in Southeast Asia. It was the capital of the Khmer Empire that ruled much of Southeast Asia between the 9th and 15th centuries. With a number of elaborate temples and countless sculptures, the site stretches through almost 250 square miles of forested area. But when researchers conducted laser scans in the area in 2015, they discovered a series of additional archaeological sites, including a city in the jungle that is believed to be larger than Cambodia's current capital city. Because so many of the original structures were built using wood, they have degraded and been covered by jungle. But by using laser beams to collect data from underneath the vegetation, researchers were able to detect mounds of earth, building foundations, walls, roads, and other structures. Surveying over 734 square miles of terrain over 90 hours, the group found more population centers and temple complexes that they didn't know existed until now. It was the most extensive airborne study ever undertaken by an archaeological project. Imagine the excitement of uncovering entire cities hidden underground. One of the most impressive finds was a medieval city not far from the ancient temple city of Angkor Wat. Thought to be between 900 and 1400 years old, it has elaborate water systems built hundreds of years before we thought they existed. How did the empire develop? What happened to the empire? How did it end up collapsing? 
there are more questions than answers. Rock stone. For over a century since its discovery, researchers have remained puzzled over Sweden's rock stone, an eight-foot-tall Viking monolith featuring the world's longest known runic inscription. It was raised by a father who dedicated it to his son who had died. It is a 700-character essay written by Varen, the grieving father who feared that winter was coming, a long period of catastrophic cold. Or perhaps in the metaphorical Game of Thrones winter is coming way. The five-ton granite slab dates back to 800 AD, and according to Smithsonian Magazine, the etchings have puzzled researchers for more than a century. Earlier this year, a research team led by Swedish scholar Per Holmberg proposed that the eulogy may hint at a broader message, and that its author feared an impending period of extreme cold for real. Varin created the inscription roughly 300 years after a series of volcanic eruptions inflicted a cold spell lasting from 536 to 550, which destroyed crops and caused mass starvation, ultimately killing up to half the Scandinavian peninsula's population. The year 536 is actually considered the worst year in history to be alive. But that's a story for another video. The runestone mentions Theodoric the Great, a 6th century ruler who was in power during the cold spell. It also contains the words nine generations, which traces back to the same time. These clues suggest that Varin's fear of extreme cold stemmed from knowledge of the event that was passed down over decades. Strange events in his recent years, including a near total solar eclipse and an especially cool summer, may have deepened the man's concerns, especially since these were considered signs of Ragnarok, the beginning of civilization's end. The runestone remains shrouded in mystery and there is a lot of room for interpretation. However, Varin's fears from so long ago are still valid today. As he says, when severe enough, global change can truly be a conflict between light and darkness, warmth and cold, life and death. Archim. While performing routine digging in the steppe of Russia's southern Ural in 1987, a team of archaeologists unearthed the circular ruins of a 3,600-year-old fortified settlement called Archim. This mysterious site was built sometime between the 17th and 16th centuries BC, and it's actually one of several similar structures throughout a large territory spanning the southern Trans-Urals and northern Kazakhstan known as the Country of Towns. Within the structure at Archim, which measures roughly 492 feet in diameter, were two defensive ramparts and 60 or so dugout dwellings with hearths, cellars, walls, and furnaces, which opened to an inner courtyard. These features point toward organized planning, powerful leadership, and a highly developed social structure among its builders. But who built it? Archim and the other buildings within the country of towns are often attributed to the earliest Indo-Iranian settlers of the region, who are connected with the Sintashta culture of the Eurasian steppe. There were horse burials found nearby, which was a common practice as the Indo-European people had a strong connection to their horse and believed their relationship would continue into the afterlife. In 2013, a skeleton with an elongated skull was discovered. This was common practice among some groups in South Ural, supporting the theory that it was the Sarmati tribe. But researchers haven't fully untangled the mysteries of Archim, and there are many secrets still waiting to be found. Missing Warplanes In 2003, search teams from the U.S. military discovered dozens of buried Iraqi Air Force fighter jets in the Al Takadum airfield west of Baghdad when searchers saw the tops of two tail fins belonging to a Cold War era MIG 25 interceptor protruding from the sand. The aircrafts were buried fully intact, but with no measures taken to protect them from the elements, begs the question of whether they would ever fly again. Other planes were found hidden under trees or draped with camouflage sheets. To better protect their hidden planes, the Iraqi military scattered the airfield with aircraft that were destroyed in previous wars, making it difficult for bombers to select targets. Before the Iraq War, intelligence analysts estimated that the Iraqi military had 300 combat aircraft left over from the 1991 Kuwait War, but the country's air force was conspicuously absent when the Iraq War took hold in 2003, leading U.S. military officials to believe that the fighter jets were not being used because they were inadequate against American and British air power. The buried planes were not considered WMD, which is what the search team was looking for when they made the discovery, but they are weapons Iraq tried to hide, said Congressman Porter Goss. While finding modern machinery in the ground may not seem like an archaeological mystery, it's possible that there are more buried planes that remain undiscovered for now. And if there's planes, who knows what else is down there?
And now for some history about horses. But first, I want to give a big thank you to Lauren Kelly and Nuts and Bolts Man, because I can, for supporting this channel. Thanks, guys. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell if you haven't already. Horse Domestication The history of horse domestication is shrouded in mystery, with researchers occasionally making discoveries that bring them one step closer to understanding how humans came to develop such a close relationship to these animals. Although, sometimes discoveries seem to just confuse us more. In 2012, a genetic study by Cambridge University researchers indicated that horses were first domesticated on the grasslands of Ukraine, southwest Russia, and west Kazakhstan around 6,000 years ago. From there, they spread across Europe and Asia while continuing to breed with wild mares along the way. Before these findings surfaced, there were two primary conflicting theories about horse domestication. One, based on traces of horse's milk found on ancient pottery and other artifacts, held that horses were tamed in the same region that the newer study identified, and around the same time. But mitochondrial DNA evidence pointed toward domestication happening in many places throughout Europe and Asia. The 2012 study brought these competing theories together by feeding nuclear DNA from modern horses into computer models programmed to explore different domestication scenarios. But William Taylor, an archaeologist from the University of Colorado at Boulder, does not consider the mystery solved. Writing for sapiens.org, he explained that archaeologists don't necessarily agree on which artifacts constitute signs of horse domestication and how remains of wild horses have been mistaken as tamed ones. Taylor, who researches the matter firsthand, stresses that getting to the bottom of it will involve reanalyzing old artifacts with modern technology and relying on DNA analysis for drawing any solid conclusions. Berkeley Mystery Wall Across California's East Bay Hills and throughout the Bay Area in general, there are a series of rock walls and other formations whose histories are only partially solved. Some acted as property boundaries for Spanish ranchers, while others were built by Chinese workers clearing land for farms and ranches. But many of these structures lack a clear explanation. These mystery walls, which stand at up to 5 feet tall, are mostly in places that are difficult to access, and none of them would have been practical as defensive structures or for any other fathomable purpose. Spanish settlers reported seeing the formations upon their arrival, and when they asked the local Native Americans about the walls, they allegedly did not have an answer. By all appearances, the structures are incredibly old, but their true age is unknown. Perhaps the most famous among them is the Berkeley Mystery Wall in Tilden Regional Park. It looks like a simple property marker or ranching wall at first glance, but upon closer examination, its crude structure is uncharacteristic of the known building methods that were used for such structures, and it also doesn't resemble the architectural styles of local cultures in general, meaning all we can do is speculate at best about who built it and why. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Devil's Corkscrews During the mid-19th century in Sioux County, Nebraska, ranchers began discovering spiral structures about as thick as a human arm, made from a hard, rock-like substance standing vertically in the ground. They contained an upward chamber at the bottom end, which often contained animal bones. Some of these bizarre formations, which were nicknamed Devil's Corkscrews, were taller than a grown man. Geologist E. H. Barber examined a 9-foot-long specimen in 1891 and discovered that it was a fossil made of a fibrous white material and filled with sand. He theorized that this and the dozens of other corkscrews he found, which he called daemonolix, were the roots of an ancient freshwater sponge which lived in a lake that once existed in the area. But the structures were more consistent with a semi-arid grassland habitat, leading Barber to conclude that they were the roots of ancient land plants, although this still doesn't explain why they contained chambers full of animal bones. American paleontologist Edward Drinker Cope and Australian paleontologist Theodore Fuchs challenged Barber's theory in 1893 by suggesting that the corkscrews were rodent burrows that filled with sediment, trapping the animals inside. Strange scratch marks seem to support this idea, and in 1905, the rodent remains found in the corkscrews were identified as belonging to the extinct Paleocaster genus, which roamed the region 22 million years ago. Finally, in 1977, fossil expert Larry Martin and Deb Bennett, his student at the University of Kansas, discovered that the Paleocaster's incisor teeth matched perfectly with the grooves on the devil's corkscrews. Ta-da! Mystery solved! Finally. The Giant's Wheel Rujum El Hiri, which is Arabic for Mound of the Wildcat, is a megalithic stone circle and burial mound in Golan Heights, currently occupied by Israel. 
Local surveyor Yitzaki Gal discovered the formation, which also goes by the Hebrew name Galgal Harifim, or the Giant's Wheel, in 1968. It sits on a remote volcanic plateau in the company of thousands of Middle Bronze Age tombs called dolmens. The structure itself is thought to be between 5,000 and 6,000 years old, and it was used for thousands of years with the burial mound being implemented around 1,300 BC. Archaeological research is ongoing, but so far, nobody seems to agree on an explanation for the structure's chosen location or its unique construction, which consists of five concentric black basalt stone rings with an outer diameter of nearly 500 feet surrounding a central 23-foot high mound. At ground level, it's hardly impressive, but the aerial view is stunning. However, the giant's wheel was built long before aircraft existed, leading some to wonder why an ancient civilization would craft something that only looks nice from above. Like the Nazca Lines, researchers also found an elaborate tomb and Bronze Age jewelry within the mound. The outer circle contains two entrances, one facing northeast, which leads to a tunnel aligned with the entrance, suggesting possible astronomical significance and the other facing southeast. The stone wheels are irregularly divided, as if to form differently sized viewing areas for spectators gathered around the mound, or for corralling animals for a special event. Two things experts seem to agree on is that the monument is the result of careful planning and abundant manpower, and that an important chieftain or other leader was buried there. The rest is largely a mystery. We have bits of information, but not the whole picture, megalithic tomb expert Yuri Berger told Reuters. Scientists come and are amazed by the site and think up their own theories. Gersu Bridge Archaeologists started excavating the ancient Sumerian city of Gersu, located in modern-day southern Iraq, in 1877. In 1929, they discovered an ambiguous, large stone structure that resembled a pair of parentheses, measuring 130 feet long and 33 feet wide with 11-foot-high walls. Researchers theorized that the enigmatic construction, as they called it, was a temple dam or water regulator and didn't think much beyond that, instead writing the seemingly inconsequential structure off as unimportant. It wasn't until 2018 that they re-examined the evidence and realized that it's a bridge that once sat over an ancient waterway which no longer exists. Gerzu is one of the world's earliest known cities, making the 4,000-year-old structure the world's oldest known surviving bridge. Archaeologist Sebastian Ray, who identified traces of an ancient canal by studying satellite imagery of the site, deducted that the bridge served as a bottleneck for the canal. For nearly a century, it has sat out in the open, with no measures taken to preserve it. As a result, it's badly weathered and damaged. The British Museum announced its plans to preserve the bridge in partnership with the Iraq State Board of Antiquities and Heritage as part of the Iraqi Emergency Heritage Management Training Scheme, a British-funded program which seeks to protect ancient sites by training archaeologists from throughout the country in practical fieldwork and cultural heritage management. King Tut's Gemstone British archaeologist Howard Carter discovered King Tut's untouched tomb in 1922. As you know, this discovery is one of the most incredible archaeological discoveries ever, and King Tut has become a symbol of Egypt. Its burial chambers were chock full of treasures like ivory statues, gold objects, and precious jewelry. One treasure chest contained a pectoral or breastplate covered in silver and gold accents and various gemstones, including a peculiar yellow-green stone in the shape of a winged scarab, representing the god Ra. Carter initially identified the substance as chalcedony, a common mineral quartz variety. A decade later, British geographer Patrick Clayton found similar pieces of material in the Great Sand Sea, a remote and desolate portion of the Libyan desert located along the Egypt-Libya border. He theorized that they were quartz mineral deposits from a dried-up lake. Finally, in 1998, an Italian mineralogist, Vincenzo De Michele, accurately identified the yellow-green substance as Libyan desert silica glass, one of the rarest substances on Earth. Like quartz, it's almost entirely made up of pure silicon dioxide, but it has a different crystal structure and contains unusual traces of elements such as iron, nickel, chromium, cobalt, and iridium. The material is only found in the Great Sand Sea, which confused experts since glass typically forms from rapidly cooling molten rock, and there are no volcanic craters in the region. In a study published last year, researchers analyzed grains of what they thought were zircon from the desert glass, only to realize they were looking at radite, a very rare mineral that is chemically similar to zircon, 
but only forms under high pressure. The only logical conclusion, according to the researchers, is that Libyan desert glass formed as a result of a meteorite impact sometime between 26 and 28 million years ago. It's the only phenomenon that would have generated the necessary conditions for creating radite, lending credibility to the theory, but information about an associated impact crater remains scarce. Pretty cool, huh? Humanoid Skull In 2007, Danish contractors replacing old sewage pipes on Sealand Island discovered a bizarre human-like skull with huge eye sockets and fangs. The Principality of Sealand is already a strange and controversial place to begin with. It consists of an abandoned World War II fortress in the North Sea called Rough Tower, where an estimated 27 residents live. They claim that the structure constitutes an independent sovereign state, but have failed to establish it as an official nation-state or gain recognition as such. Workers allegedly found the strange skull underneath a building that once belonged to a butcher while removing century-old pipes. Experts at a veterinary college in Copenhagen could not link it to any known species on Earth, and subsequent carbon dating at the University of Copenhagen's Niels Bohr Institute estimated its age at around 800 years old. Neolithic artifacts, including animal bones, stone axes, and equipment were also found at the site, but could not be linked to the skull, which some speculate belonged to a human-alien hybrid. There is a long-standing rumor among conspiracy theorists that Sealand once served as a meeting place for members of a secret society of writers called the Order of Pegasus Light, which they claim was formed during the 1300s. Many, if not most, believe that the skull, which remains shrouded in mystery to this day, is simply a hoax. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. The Works of the Old Men There are more and more large, ancient, geometric stone structures coming to light every year. These stone geoglyphs can be found spread throughout Syria, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan, occupying an even bigger area than the famed Nazca Lines of Peru. They depict various designs of different sizes, including kites and wheel-like shapes. From the ground, they are almost impossible to identify, but from the air, they are clear for the eye to see. The local Bedouins call the stone structures the works of the old men, but very little else is known about their origins since they are so old. Who built them and why? Most are estimated to be somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000 years old, but other archaeologists have found two wheel-shaped patterns that date back some 8,500 years, also making them older than the Nazca Lines in Peru, which are estimated to be around 2,000 years old. Most people didn't know anything about them until they were witnessed from the sky in 1927 by British Royal Air Force Flight Lieutenant Percy Maitland as he flew over a lava field in Jordan. Some of the geoglyphs look like spoked wheels, while others are simply circular, and others look like kites. Most believe that they had astrological or seasonal significance to their creators. Some of the wheel-shaped structures align with the winter solstice, but others don't seem to coincide with anything at all. The kite-shaped structures were possibly used for hunting, with a structure that could have been used to funnel animals into an enclosed area, making it difficult for them to escape before becoming the next meal. Another possibility is that the kites were used to prevent camels from straying. No excavation has been performed on the works of the old men yet, but doing so would probably provide further clues about where they came from. Fisher Canyon Footprint In 1917, a miner from the Nevada Mining Company claimed to find a 200 million year old shoe print. Otherwise known as an out of place artifact, the miner claimed that he saw a fossil in some loose rocks and that it was actually a shoe heel imprint stuck in limestone from the Triassic period. An out-of-place artifact is an object that does not seem to belong where it's found or when it dates back to. Now known as the Fisher Canyon footprint, this artifact is a fossilized piece of limestone that appears to contain a shoe print. Hmm, what do you think? There are three different stories about the fossil's discovery, although it seems like besides the minor story, the most favored but still unproven version is that it was found sometime before 1917 by John T. Reed, an amateur engineer and archaeologist in Fisher Canyon, Nevada. Some people have erroneously identified the fossil as being imprinted onto 5 million year old coal. It's actually limestone and was reportedly dated to over 200 million years ago. One of the alleged discoverers, Alfred E. Knapp, claimed that the shoe print was made when the rock was in what he called its plastic state. The fossil's age and authenticity as a shoe print were supposedly verified by an expert named Samuel Hubbard. 
leading to questions about how a shoe-clad human could have possibly walked the Earth so long ago. But these claims have never been substantiated, and geologists who have examined the artifact believe that it's a natural formation and not a shoe print at all. The Philistines Archaeologists know very little about the historically infamous Philistines, a group of people who arrived in the Levant during the 12th century BC, when many Middle Eastern and Greek societies were falling. The Levant was an area that included Israel, Gaza, Lebanon, and Syria. They left behind no texts of their own, so we mostly know about them through ancient Egyptian and Syrian texts, as well as the Hebrew Bible, which consistently described the Philistines as violent barbarians with no appreciation for art or culture. But who were these people? Ramses III fought them in battle, and the ancient Israelites also fought with them many times. The story of David and Goliath comes from a story about the giant Philistine leader Goliath and David who would go on to become king of Israel. Over the past hundred years or so, archaeologists have been looking for evidence of the Philistines to try to learn more about them. While there are a handful of artifacts that experts consider to be distinctly Philistine, they don't always agree on what qualifies as a Philistine artifact or burial. In 2016, however, archaeologists uncovered a large cemetery outside the ancient city of Ashkelon, which the Philistines controlled from the 12th century BC to the 7th century BC. It contained the remains of 211 people, which date back to the time the Philistines were present there. The discovery is the first of its kind, finally allowing us to find out more about who these mysterious people were. DNA testing on remains from different time periods suggests that the Philistines came from Crete, Greece, Sardinia, and the Iberian Peninsula, which corroborates the historical records other societies kept about them. Within centuries, the Philistine burials had a genetic signature very similar to that of the local population, indicating that they began intermarrying and having children with locals quickly after their arrival. Despite this, they appear to have remained culturally distinct. But there are still many mysteries to unravel about the Philistines, including the possibility that their origins may be more varied than the evidence has shown so far, especially since they were a migratory group and may have mixed with various local populations along their journeys. The Mysteries of Uruk The ancient Mesopotamian city of Uruk was founded around 4,500 BC. It was home to the famous King Gilgamesh and the tale of his quest for immortality. Located in the southern region of Sumer in modern-day Warqa, Iraq, it was considered one of the world's first known true cities with urbanization and state formation. It transitioned from agricultural villages to a large urban center with traders and colonists. Uruk is where the first ever writing system was developed and where the first monumental stone architecture emerged. Its residents designed the ziggurat, which were rectangular, stepped towers and probably inspired the story of the Tower of Babel. Here is also where the cylinder seal was invented that the ancient Mesopotamians used to mark their personal property and sign documents. It was the largest and most influential Mesopotamian city at a time when the region was rapidly urbanizing, acting as its primary trade and administration hub. Uruk thrived from the time it was founded until roughly 300 AD, when people began leaving. Pretty much all the excavation sites throughout Mesopotamia contain artifacts from Uruk, such as statues and bowls, which act as a testament to the ancient city's far-reaching power. One strange artifact, which was discovered at Uruk itself, is a sculpture of a priest encased inside a decorated sphere. Not much is known about this, so if you have any ideas, let me know in the comments. Despite this, questions linger among experts about what led to Uruk becoming the world's first city, why it was more powerful than other, more strategically located cities, and how it exercised its local and regional authority. It seems that its rulers had a very aggressive expansionist policy, although it was sometimes subjected to foreign rulers. However, despite who was in charge, it remained a significant city for several civilizations that ruled over Mesopotamia. Fuente Magna You've probably heard of the Rosetta Stone, a granite stone containing inscriptions that played a major role in deciphering ancient languages. A similar stone was discovered in 1958 near Lake Titicaca in Bolivia. The large stone vessel was called the Fuente Magna Bowl and nicknamed the Rosetta Stone of the Americas. This highly controversial discovery features inscriptions in two languages, a Proto-Sumerian ancient alphabet and a local script of the ancient Pucara. This artifact begs the question of whether ancient Andean people somehow interacted with the Sumerians, despite these regions being separated by thousands of miles and located on different continents. 
A farmer accidentally came across the object and it was taken to the city of La Paz. Bolivian archaeologist Max Portugal Zamora attempted to decipher the strange inscriptions shortly after the bull was discovered. He was unsuccessful and for the next four decades the Fuente Magna sat in storage. Then an ancient languages expert, Dr. Clyde Ahmed Winters, identified the unknown language as a 5,000-year-old script once used in the Sahara region and deciphered the meaning of the text, which appears to be a religious dedication to a fertility goddess. But how did this bull with proto-Sumerian inscriptions end up in Bolivia? Several researchers believe that perhaps Sumerian people settled in Bolivia sometime after 2500 BC. They were known to sail the Indian subcontinent and may have entered a current that took them to the Americas. Perhaps here, while searching for food, they encountered the Pucaras, and that some chose to stay and make a new life, and the cultures intermingled. But for now, nobody knows for sure, and researchers continue to debate the topic. Hopefully, more artifacts like this will be found, and further research will help tell the story of this artifact. History is full of surprises. Gari Wall Late last year, archaeologists in western Iran discovered the remains of a 71-mile-long ancient stone wall that was practically unheard of in the academic world. Locals, of course, had known about it for a long time, calling it the Gari Wall. The structure is poorly preserved, making it difficult to calculate its original dimensions. The researchers estimate it was 13 feet wide and 10 feet high. It was constructed from a mixture of local materials, including cobbles, boulders, and gypsum mortar, and required a great deal of labor and time to build. Along the wall, there are remnants of structures that have been destroyed. The archaeologists believe it was built between the 4th century BC and the 6th century AD based on pottery found alongside it, but they do not know who built it or why. Their best guesses so far are that the wall served as a defensive purpose or held symbolic meaning. It may have marked the border of an ancient empire. Perhaps the Parthians or the Sasanians, who were famous for building castles, organizing cities, and irrigation systems, so they would have had the power to build this enormous wall. The Gari Wall is one of several ancient walls throughout Iran, with the others being found in the northern and northeastern parts of the country. Swiss Stonehenge Lake Constance is a 207 square mile body of water shared between Switzerland, Germany, and Austria. In 2015, archaeologists discovered a series of bizarre man-made stones or cairns in the Swiss portion of the lake, 15 feet below the water surface. They returned to the site late last year to conduct more research. The stones, which range in size up to 8.3 feet wide, are thought to be a Neolithic monument. They run parallel to the Swiss shoreline and are spaced evenly apart. Carbon dating on stones from a certain section of the formation showed that they were placed there around 5,500 years ago. At the time, the site was likely either located along the shoreline or in shallow water. The archaeologists who made the discovery claim that the arrangement of the stones indicates that they were placed there by humans, not nature, ruling out their initial suspicion that the stones were possibly remnants that fell to the bottom of the lake from a glacier that was in the lake around 18,000 years ago. Scientists are unsure of the stone's purpose, and an international team of researchers plans to carry out further analysis on them in hopes of learning more. And while the nickname, Swiss Stonehenge, quickly took hold, experts asserted that they had nothing to do with this and were not trying to compare the underwater rocks to Stonehenge. But it is catchy. Vikings in North America For a long time, there was only one confirmed Viking settlement in the New World, located at Lanz O Meadows in northern Newfoundland. But archaeologists have now discovered at least three former settlements that the Vikings may have occupied. They believe that places mentioned in Viking sagas about their voyages to the New World, including Heluland, Markland, and Vinland, can be found in modern-day Baffin Island, Labrador, and elsewhere in Canada. In 2016, a team of archaeologists announced the discovery of the Point Rosé site in Newfoundland. Radiocarbon dating of artifacts at the site, including a dirt structure and a suspected hearth, placed the item sometime between the 9th and 13th centuries. Another Newfoundland site, called Sop's Arm, bears evidence of large animal traps called pitfalls, which no indigenous group of North America was known to use. This was a Viking strategy. On Baffin Island, above the Arctic Circle, researchers found possible evidence of metalworking tools and what appear to be the remains of a building. There are numerous other theories about potential Viking settlements, but no evidence of them has turned up yet, and the sites containing archaeological evidence have yet to be confirmed as genuine Viking encampments. 
Indus Script The writing system of the Indus Valley Civilization, which flourished around 4,000 years ago in modern-day Pakistan and northwest India, is one of several ancient languages that experts have not yet deciphered. Their confusion is not for a lack of trying or for a lack of evidence, considering thousands of short inscriptions have been discovered. Most of these inscriptions contain only four or five characters, and nobody seems to agree on how to read them. In fact, experts also disagree on the underlying language behind the writing, with some even claiming that the characters are symbols with no direct connections to speech. These conflicting theories make any proposals about what the inscriptions translate to even less credible. Knowing the meaning of the language would potentially provide clarity to rival ethnic groups who claim to be ancestors of the Indus Valley civilization. Scholars invested in the matter have actually gotten many scary threats. In 2004, an anonymous donor offered a $10,000 reward to anyone who discovers an Indus text containing over 50 characters which would make the decipherment process much easier than it is with the short samples that are currently available. The offer still stands today. Coral Snakes Coral snakes with their bright bands of red, black, and yellow are quite venomous. Predators have learned this over the years and stay as far away from them as possible. Their bright colors are already warning you to stay away. However, some less venomous but clever snakes have taken the coral snake's coloration into account and have been able to evolve accordingly. Mimicry in the animal kingdom is quite spectacular and gives animals an enormous advantage. One snake is venomous, the others not so much. But if you are a predator, do you really want to risk it? Not really. Several kinds of snakes, such as the milk and king snakes, mimic the coral snake's color scheme. They all have red, yellow, and black bands around their body. The average person might not be able to tell them apart, but with these snakes, their yellow-colored sections are hugged by bands of yellow on either side. It is not precisely the same color ordering as found in coral snakes, but most of their predators don't notice. In fact, most see this coloration, think they are about to attack something dangerous, and steer clear. In biology, this kind of mimicry where an animal is trying to copy a more dangerous animal is known as Batesian mimicry. There is actually a helpful rhyme to help remember which snake is which. Red touch yellow, kill a fellow. Red touch black, venom lack. If you ever catch a glance of a red, black, and yellow snake, keep this in mind. Dead Leaf Mantis Praying mantises are arguably the most regal insects in the animal kingdom. They exude a certain class to which other kinds of insect cannot compare. I rescued one from my cat once. Don't worry, I got it in time. But I held it for a little bit and it was awesome. One particular species of mantis stands out from the rest because of its mimicry. The Dead Leaf Mantis. It should be clear how the Dead Leaf Mantis got its name. This type of praying mantis has evolved to look just like dead or dying leaves. The resemblance is striking. In color, size, and form, the mantis strikes a shocking similarity to everyday leaves that you wouldn't think twice about if you noticed them on the ground. To take the mimicry even further, the mantis imitates the movement of the leaves. If it notices predators nearby, it will sway like a leaf in the wind. There are several different species of dead leaf mantis, which can imitate different kinds of leaves, although they are almost always brown. Northern Pygmy Owls In this case, the owl uses self-mimicry. Self-mimicry occurs whenever one part of an animal's body is meant to look like another part of its body. Many animals employ some form of self-mimicry. Some mosquitoes have wings that look like a head, which confuses their predators. Butterflies can sometimes look like they have antennae at the bottom of their wings. Because predators think that this must be their head, the butterfly's head remains protected and it has more time to escape. The most striking instance of self-mimicry has to go to northern pygmy owls. These owls have spots on the back of their heads that look just like a pair of eyes from a distance. They're watching you. Or are they? Given that owls can spin their heads very far, this gives off the impression that the pygmy owls are always watching. It isn't entirely clear why owls develop these spots, but scientists think that these eye spots could trick potential predators into believing that they are being watched. Is it working? Blue Striped Fang Blenny The Blue Striped Fang Blenny is a kind of fish that lives in coral reefs around the Pacific and Indian Oceans. It looks innocent enough, right? But they are actually venomous. The Fang Blenny tends to hide in tiny holes to avoid detection, but of course, it takes more than that to survive. The Fang Blenny is a specialized mime. In particular, they mimic the youth of another species of fish, the Blue Streak Cleaner Wrasse. 
This latter species of fish clean up for larger fish by biting off the parasites on their bodies. So these guys are actually quite helpful, hence the name of cleaner fish. The fang blenny uses this to their advantage and will even do the same little swim dance. Because they look like a young blue streak, big fish will often approach them for a quick clean, at which point the fang blenny bites them and then leaves the scene. The fang blenny's venom, which also contains opioids, helps to dull its host's reaction to the bite and also buys the fang blenny some time. After utilizing this mimicry, the fang blenny spy is well fed and no worse for wear. Over time, the adult fish learn to tell the difference between a cleaner and a biter. Be sure to subscribe and leave your favorite animal using mimicry in the comments below. Katie did. While in many cases animals are trying to protect themselves from scary predators to avoid getting eaten by something bigger, sometimes animals use it to capture prey. Katydids are masters at mimicry and camouflage. While stick bugs look like sticks, katydids can look like all kinds of leaves. Found in humid and tropical areas, katydids have mastered the art of speckled, decaying, and frayed leaves. Even within the same species, no two individuals are alike. There are actually more than 6,000 kinds of katydids, but they are unified by their big back legs, leaf-like body, and skinny antenna. Katydids listen around for the sound of a male cicada's mating songs. Once they hear it, they implement a clever trick. They mimic the kind of wing clicks that female cicadas use to indicate that they are open to reproduction. After the katydid does so, the male cicadas come nearer in the hopes that they will come across a female. However, they have been tricked, and they are instead greeted with a hidden leaf slash katydid that attacks them. The katydid also has to watch out as the opposite can happen. Why do you think their mimicry is so extreme? Why does each one have to be so unique? Because their main predator is quite intelligent. Monkeys. Each one has to be different so the monkeys don't recognize them all as a tasty snack. They might find a few, but others can get away unobserved. Cuttlefish. Cuttlefish are perplexing and beautiful creatures. Their wavy skin has an almost psychedelic quality, and they are no dummies either. They employ two distinct kinds of mimicry. Cuttlefish use a kind of self-mimicry to find a mate. During mating season, male cuttlefish will often fight for dominance to win a female and reproduce. Generally speaking, the smaller one loses. However, this doesn't bring it down. The smaller cuttlefish will mimic the body color of a female cuttlefish, or even pretend to have an egg sac. Once they have tricked the bigger male cuttlefish who gets distracted, they will dart right past them and mate with the female. Scientists have also observed cuttlefish raising and changing the color of their arms, and then flapping them while hovering close to the bottom of the ocean floor. Many think that this is to mimic the behavior of hermit crabs. This could serve two purposes. One, crabs have a hard shell which deters predators who don't want a crunchy meal. Second, since hermit crabs don't usually feed on living things, some of the cuttlefish's prey might venture close to the ocean floor and come within its striking zone, giving the cuttlefish an easy meal. Four eye butterfly fish. One of the most interesting kinds of mimicry that animals use to psych out predators are eye spots. These are exactly what they sound like. They are spots on animals' bodies that look like eyes. Eye spots are useful because predators tend to aim for the eyes in order to successfully attack the head. Eye spots thus get predators to aim in spots that will be less effective. A great variety of animals use eye spots. Many moths and butterflies have beautiful patterns on their wings that take the form of eyes. Peacocks have large eye spots on their feathers that are used to indicate their reproductive suitability. There is actually a direct correlation between the number of eye spots and reproductive success in peacocks. Many bobcats have eye spots behind their ears, which can serve to communicate social signals to other cats. The four-eye butterfly fish have almost comically large eye spots at the base of their tails. When their predators see these spots, they think that the butterfly fish will flee in the direction of their eye spot. But this is a trick. The butterfly fish will really go in the other direction, which gives them the upper hand in evading those who would want to eat them. Two-headed snake. Eye spots are a pretty impressive thing for multiple species to independently evolve, but what about head spots? As it turns out, this is not such a far-fetched concept. The yellow-lipped sea crate has developed a way to trick predators into thinking that its head is located on its tail. This is because the coloration of its tail is similar to the coloration on its head. So when the snake puts its actual head into coral reefs in search of food, its tail, which looks like its head, is moving around. Even though the sea crate is incredibly venomous, it has no defense when it is searching for food. It gets a little distracted. 
But since its head-looking tail is so active when it's digging into these crevices, most predators, and even many scientists, see the active head and steer clear, hoping to avoid a bite. In fact, this trick even fooled the scientist who first discovered the phenomenon. Thinking that he was looking at an active head above water, he was shocked to see another one come up from below. Only then did he figure out what was going on. If this trick can work on human scientists, then it's no wonder why it works to deter sharks, birds, and other fish. Caterpillars What the heck is this? Surprise! Not a snake, but I'm sure you already figured that out. It's the hawk's moth caterpillar. Felipe de Andrade, filmmaker and host of National Geographic Wild's Untamed, has been around the world recording all kinds of wildlife, like lions and sharks and venomous spiders. But when someone in Costa Rica told him about a caterpillar in the rainforest that acted like a pit viper, he had to see it for himself. He said, the first time I saw it, I was in complete and utter disbelief. National Geographic reports that the sight of the bug sent him laughing and crying at the same time. When he got a little too close, the snake-like caterpillar felt his breath and jabbed at the air. The surprising but harmless strike sent Dandrade reeling back. If they get scared, they will puff up the front of their bodies to show off huge spots that look like eyes, along with fake scales and a snake-like curve. They will even pretend to strike. These little guys are not afraid. Caterpillars are experts at blending in, and the caterpillar of the giant swallowtail butterfly takes it to a whole other level. In this case, if it looks like bird poop, it just might be a caterpillar. Other moth caterpillar species also have a white and brown coloring that makes them look just like bird droppings. They will also change their movement and posture so they look just like a dollop of excrement to avoid predators, and they are able to hide much better in this shape than lying stretched out. When the giant swallowtail caterpillars are young, they are a dark shade of brown with white streaks throughout. Birds are the caterpillar's primary predator, and they are not interested in eating that. As the caterpillar grows and gets bigger, they turn a yellowish green and develop two huge false eye spots, making them look like a snake. Very few predators prey on snakes, giving the swallowtail yet another advantage. As a last resort, if the caterpillar is under attack, it spits out its osmetrium, which is a Y-shaped tongue-like organ that resembles the tongue of a snake. In addition to emitting a sour smell, its appearance is a further predator deterrent. Deep Sea Fish Snakes are pretty scary and powerful in the animal kingdom, and many animals try to be them so that predators will stay away. But there are even scarier creatures lurking at the bottom of the sea. Abyssal fish, or deep sea fish, that have evolved to overcome extreme environmental challenges. For example, anglerfish, which swivel through the dark depths of the ocean with their ghostly faces, giant teeth, and bioluminescent fins, waiting to attack their prey. And attack they will. Anglerfish have a very distinctive feature worn only by females. They have a piece of dorsal spine that hangs over their mouths like a lure that lights up in the pitch black sea. Using this bioluminescence, their lure looks a lot like the prey of other deep sea creatures. Once they come towards the light in the dark, towards the innocent looking glowworm, boom! They are snatched by the cranky anglerfish. Just like in Finding Nemo, where Marlin and Dory encounter the lure of an anglerfish while swimming blindly in the deep sea. Anglerfish will even wiggle their lures in order to better approximate the movement of other abyssal fish's prey as they stay hidden. Viperfish and other deep sea fish have also evolved to become exceptionally dark. How do you blend in with nothingness? You mimic a black hole! No, I'm just kidding, but they have been able to adapt so much that they effectively disappear. They just have to mimic the water and darkness around them. The Mimic Octopus The Mimic Octopus is nature's master of deception, and predators will get punked. Found in the Indo-Pacific, this creature will mimic just about any venomous or bad-tasting creature it can, depending on who is after it. Unlike other animals whose camouflage comes from constant colorations, an octopus can change its color depending on its needs and even the texture of its skin. While most animals mimic just one thing, this octopus can impersonate several animals and change right away between them. National Geographic reports that it can also contort its body to take on the appearance and behavior of several animals, including the lionfish, jellyfish, sea snake, a shrimp, a crab, and more. To mimic the sea snake, for example, the octopus tucks into a hole, sticking just two arms out that display black bands and ripple them in opposite directions, mimicking a snake's movement. Even more remarkably, the cephalopod only takes the form of a sea snake when bothered by damselfish, who are preyed on by sea snakes. 
Thanks for watching. What is your favorite instance of animal mimicry? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to like and subscribe for more. See you next time. Bye.